on a question of the day that, um, you know, we can, you know, use some of those content, you know, comments to turn that into future questions of the day and future articles. So it really is, you know, taking a lot of the peer to peer um, content and meet and, and driving that into research. One of the things that I always say is that, you know, Facebook is a wonderful tool and a great way to connect with people. But at the end of the day, you know, having 400 likes and eight comments isn't being reviewed by a bunch of doctors. So what's really neat about Glue is that, you know, it's a, it's a safe and secure environment and everything that we're capturing, we're turning into, you know, the future of research. So um, if a whole bunch of people join Glue and talk about their, you know, fears with and frustrations with living with celiac, we might just make that a research question someday, <laughs> uh, which is really great. Um, so again, this is just an example article, um, T1D Exchange aims to uncover the link between T1D and celiac. Um, we have a, a clinic registry of over 26,000 patients living with diabetes that answer about 150 questions every year. So we're able to take a lot of that information, analyze it, and then write articles um, based on some of those research results to continuously provide uh, updates and research for um, the type one community. Um, and honestly, we we really just want everyone to join our community. Um, you know, once you sign in, you uh, we really encourage people to complete a profile. And what that profile does is ask you about 10 or 12 questions about your diabetes management, um, what kind of insulin you might use, whether or not you use an insulin pump or injections. Um, and so we use that information to target you for studies. So if we're doing a survey for spouses on diabetes management in the home, my husband would get a link to participate in that survey based on him filling out his profile. Uh, so we really, really encourage people to complete that profile once they, uh, once they register. And that's honestly basically it. it. It's an awesome tool for, you know, anyone affected by type one. Um, it's really great because it's, it's anonymized information and it's a safe and secure place. So my screen name, everyone now that can see my face uh, is Glue Anna, but it's very much like the, um, you know, AOL instant messenger days where you have an alias name um, that you can create. So a lot of times our users feel a little bit more vulnerable to asking for help or for commenting on something than they were to stay on a Twitter or a Facebook uh, where people's names are more identified with. So it's, it's a really great opportunity for, for parents and siblings, um, anybody to join and, and feel like they're making a difference in research. So now, um, so now uh, I want to turn it over to Danielle, who I think has called in um, and can talk a little bit about her experience living with both. Danielle, are you on? Maybe um, while we, Anna and I, um, figure out how to connect with Danielle, um, maybe Pamela could go ahead and uh, get started in sharing her experience as a mother of someone with uh, celiac and type 1 diabetes. Hi, I just want to thank everybody for participating in the call. Thank you so much, Janelle Smith and the Celiac Disease Foundation for having a conversation about celiac disease and type 1 diabetes. Um, I think, Janelle, if you take your microphone off, that echo will stop. Okay, sorry. Is that better? Um, my son was diagnosed with celiac disease at age seven. Seven years later, we received a diagnosis of type 1 diabetes. My husband and I thought we were able to control celiac disease, but we knew we couldn't do that for diabetes. Diabetes truly was a disease that our, the patient needs to understand to take 100% control of. Our family is the moral support for our son. We try to empower him with knowledge about type one. And I'm so excited to hear about glue. So thank you so much. We will all register, I promise. Um, we've also empowered him with recent studies that are out there. And 
The latest technology has been really encouraging. Um, our son's symptoms were he was thirsty and urinating a lot, extremely hungry. His vision changed. He became fatigued. He started slurring his words. The morning I brought him to the doctors, I noticed a sweet smell on his breath. Um, it turned out to be the ketones, um, which were the blood sugars that were the glucose that start to build up in his bloodstream and not in the cells. He also lost a ton of weight in a short amount of time. It all seems obvious now when I hear Janelle talk about the symptoms, but I'm learning not to beat myself up for not diagnosing him. Diabetes was not on our radar. A couple of things for the audience to take home today is to stay active with the Celiac Disease Foundation. Our family learned that even though our son, he went on a gluten-free diet and he was thriving, the work doesn't end here. We all learning this today. Make sure your child sees their doctors, even if they're feeling well. Empower them. Get them in support groups and therapy. And Janelle, I'm going to be knocking on your door because I know nutrition's crucial, especially managing these blood sugars. Um, he is a teenager, so the growth hormones have been very challenging. And lastly, just to be patient, take a deep breath. This is a tough road for our children and our young adults and adults to be, but this will be their new normal. And again, thank you so much to everyone in the panel. Pamela, thank you so much. I know that so many mothers are going to relate to everything you've just said and the emotions that have come up for you. I'm wondering if you can share um, any uh, tips, um, some that you've mentioned to me before, just um, for managing, helping your son to manage his uh, diabetes. Well, I think one of the most important things for us was that when he goes to see his endocrinologist, we make sure the endocrinologist has eye contact with our son 100% because it empowers him. They can have a conversation. Um, it's just so, it's so important. important. I think um, there was something that you were mentioning to me earlier about um, learning which sources of carbohydrate um, works for your son? And you know, what kinds of snacks do you keep on hand for him? Well, we initially were doing protein bars, but then his sugar levels went high. So now a lot of nuts, almonds have been really helpful. Um, definitely mixing you know, a carb with a protein. But, you know, he's a teenager and he's going to want to cheat. Unfortunately, he's learned the hard way a couple of times. But um, the protein bars have been very challenging for us right now. It may not be for everybody, but for him especially. And I think before you were telling me about a, a cool scale that helped you figure it out, um, Graham. Right. So Bed Bath & Beyond carries a scale that we're able to place food on top of, it'll give us all the nutritional facts. And um, so we're weighing fruit to Swedish pancakes, to waffles, to homemade cookies. And it's been a godsend. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing those tips. And um, if anyone has questions for Pamela individually, uh, go ahead and you can email us at info at celiac.org and we will be sure to pass those on to her because I know that she's happy to, to connect with anyone who might be having a similar experience. And of course, it sounds like the GLUE community is going to be essential for all those who are managing this. Um, Anna, if you want to unmute yourself, I was wondering if maybe there's something you could share um, on behalf of Danielle. Sure. Yeah. No, I think. Can you un? Can you mute you? Yeah. Um. I mean, I unfortunately. I mean, fortunately, unfortunately, I I don't have celiac, but I 
living with type one, um, you know, I can certainly speak to Pam. Being a teenager is really hard uh, in general. And I think any parent that has to deal with a child uh, with any sort of long term constant illness is a godsend because it's a lot of work. Um, you know, there were a lot of times where my blood sugar was really high and I couldn't figure out why or I snuck food too. I mean, but I think every every day is a different day, um, and I wouldn't be able to do it without the support of my friends and family. There are so many different um, summer camps and online communities now that offer programs just for people with um, type 1 diabetes. Um, I had the insane experience, which was awesome, um, and that's how I met Danielle, actually, um, is, a, you know, through attending uh, summer camp. And so, you know, we've remained good friends. And I think having supportive community for parents for um, and a really supportive um, endocrinology team that, that communicates really effectively. If you don't like your endocrinologist, you are allowed to fire them <laughs> is what I've learned. You know, you're, you're the patient. They're the doctor. So you, you do have the ability to kind of shop around uh, until you find someone that you really click with because that happened to me and now I'm with a team that I can email and know that I'll hear back from within a few hours. Um, so I think that would be my my biggest piece of advice. Um, I personally choose to eat pretty paleo, um, which is the no grains and no dairy just because I know that it works really well for me and my blood sugars. Um, but it is really difficult and I always carry, you know, honey or raisins, you know, something that's going to constantly make me be extra cautious and prepared should there be nothing I can eat. Um, but it is a challenge. And, um, and hopefully, you know, people that are listening can relate and um, please everybody join glue. There's actually a group on glue that we've created just called um, type one and celiac. So if you're living with both um, conditions, we encourage you to join that group and, and start a discussion with someone that is, um, that's having some of the same concerns. Excellent advice. Thank you so much, Anna. Sorry that we weren't able to connect with Danielle. Um, but if anyone also has questions for Anna, they're uh, welcome to contact her. Um, Anna, if you want to, um, it's okay if I put your email address out. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Awesome. Um, so if anyone has any more thoughts on diabetes, you're welcome to send in a message through the group chat. Uh, if not, I'm going to thank uh, T1B Exchange so much for participating. And I think we're going to move on to um, other health and weight loss resolutions for the new year. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Anna. Okay, so I know I'm sure a lot of you have uh, made some resolutions or some goals uh, for the new year, uh, and absolutely there are many ways to revamp uh, and use food to improve your health on a gluten-free diet. Remember that if you have celiac disease, the healthiest thing you can do for your body is to make sure that you're not eating gluten. Uh, meet with a dietitian that's specialized. Make sure you're getting follow-up care with your physician uh, to make sure that you're doing well. And um, in terms of making New Year's resolution, I have a couple tips for avoiding the phenomenon that seems to happen where February 1st, uh, the resolutions seem to fade away. Um, first of all, Try to make positive goals rather than negative ones. Um, if we frame things in the positive, such as eat this, eat more of that, it helps us not to feel deprived or to feel restricted, and we're less likely to rebel against our own rules. So I do recommend making positive goals instead of cutting out foods and saying, don't eat this or don't eat that. Uh, I also recommend starting and making small and realistic goals because really drastic diet changes um, very rarely stick for a long period of time, um, such as making goals like eat more one more serving of fruit per day or 
two more servings of vegetables instead of cut out all sugar or eat perfectly. Those are very huge goals um, that are not specific and difficult to achieve. I also recommend to, you know, get back to your goals, get back on the wagon, no matter what month of the year it is. Um, resolutions don't start January 1st and end December 31st. Um, they can, changes can happen at any time. Um, and it usually takes a, a while to make a change that really Really um, also, to help yourself with, with making changes to improve your health, I do recommend enlisting the help of others, whether it's family, making changes of family, or with your, your spouse, um, getting involved with a registered dietitian or a health coach. Um, Working with somebody um, is also is always much better for keeping you accountable to your goals and writing through the ups and downs. Uh, in terms of finding the support, I just want to remind you that Celiac Disease Foundation has an excellent, amazing um, healthcare provider directory where you can actually find a provider near you based on um, you know what specialty you're looking for. You can filter based on it. They've received continuing education in celiac disease or gluten-related disorders. So you can find that at celiac.org um, slash provider directory. A lot of people um, do ask me about managing weight after being diagnosed with celiac disease. And I say that weight gain is very typical after diagnosis, even for those who were already in a normal weight range or considered overweight or obese. Uh, basically, all the food that was being eaten before diagnosis was not being fully absorbed. Um, so you likely were able or were having to eat more food that your body needed than now that your intestines are healing, you may need less food. So some people um, may gain weight if just as a sign that their intestines are healing and it can be a very helpful and accomplishing goal. Um, but others you know, we'll find that they do have to cut back on portion sizes or change the way they eat in order to maintain healthy weight. So in order to do this, I recommend always focusing on eating whole foods. Um, you know, the fiber, the rich nutrients that are in the naturally gluten-free whole foods are going to be very filling and satisfying. Uh, relying on, you know, packaged and processed products um, is usually where we see a lot of weight gain in those who start the gluten-free diet. And as always, um, just incorporate more activity in your life. It doesn't have, you don't have to become a marathon runner. If you're currently doing no activity, try walking one day a week. Any, adding any activity is better um, than nothing, essentially. Um, some individuals who have been diagnosed with celiac disease um, were very underweight prior to diagnosis or lost a significant amount of weight. So um, just to reiterate, weight gain should begin within the first three months on the gluten-free diet that signifies that the intestines are healing. Um, and children um, may often or should continue to grow and maybe make up for growth that they had missed uh, in the period prior to diagnosis. So you might even see you know, a six inch growth in one year for a child that has been diagnosed and is successfully on a gluten-free diet. So if this um, weight regain or growth is not happening within the first few months, uh, it's very important to go back to your gastroenterologist to get a further workup, see if there's anything else that's going on. Um, you also are highly recommended to see a specialized dietitian. The reason is that the most common cause of continued malabsorption is gluten that's still in the diet. We all know that it's a rough transition um, starting the gluten-free diet, and in many cases, they're kind of hidden or unrealized sources. So working with a specialized dietitian is a great way to make sure that you're healing after diagnosis. Some other causes of continued malabsorption is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, 
very common. Um, colitis, especially ulcerative or microscopic colitis. Uh, Crohn's disease, uh, there might be a dual diagnosis on top of the celiac, um, or sometimes pancreatic insufficiency, which would prevent fat from being absorbed um, properly. Um, so in general, to maximize your health, I recommend using the naturally gluten-free foods that are abundant around us and really full of all the nutrition that we need. A couple ways that I recommend you do this. To play with your grains, play with your food. Uh, so many of us stick to rice and corn and potatoes as our source of grains. Um, you know, they're common in the foods that we find in the grocery stores. Uh, but a lot of our naturally gluten-free and ancient grains are just packed full of nutrition. They're full of protein, they're full of fiber, essential B vitamins and minerals uh, that really those with celiac disease need. Uh, so try to incorporate quinoa in your diet or buckwheat, amaranth or millet, teff or sorghum. Um, you can find these in, in your whole foods store or natural food store. Um, be sure to choose ones that are labeled gluten-free to avoid any potential uh, cross-contact with gluten. And here I have uh, just a sample menu of how to incorporate um, more various grains in your diet. For example, for breakfast, you could mix buckwheat and oats, you know, gluten-free oats, of course, um, together, make a hot cereal and serve with nuts, berries, and yogurt. Uh, for lunch, you might have a green salad with beans uh, and cooked quinoa and millet, which you see pictured in the middle here. For dinner, you might um, add some focaccia that's made from sorghum to your you know, salmon and kale. This is just a really simple way using all naturally gluten-free foods to enhance your health. Another idea is to institute um, meatless Mondays and fatty fish Fridays. Um, the reason I chose to recommend this is that the American diet is very kind of animal product heavy. And a lot of times we are maybe getting too much of certain times, types of fats and proteins um, that you know we need in our diet, but may be out of balance. So just by one day a week choosing not to eat meat, you can utilize some other vegetarian sources of protein um, and make sure to increase, you know, just by doing that, you're going to increase the unsaturated fatty acids in your diet, the omega 3s and omega 6s, and you're going to decrease um, your cholesterol and saturated fat intake. Um, a recent study um, showed that just two servings of fatty fish each week could prevent chronic illness and decrease overall inflammation. And um, so just having fish um, once a week or twice a week can really improve your health. Um, those fatty fishes include salmon, uh, mackerel, and trout. Include um, leafy grains. Leafy grains, you know, dark grains, are not only beneficial for their green color, actually underneath that green, it includes all the phytochemicals and vitamins uh, that are included in red, orange, uh, purple, and white vegetables. Um, really great cancer fighting and antioxidants and rich in fiber. Um, leafy grains have vitamin A, C, K, and folic acid. Um, and I recommend sauteing them lightly um, and serving with a source of fat like olive oil to maximize your absorption. All right. Um, one last way to maximize your health, and then I'm going to get to answering some questions. Um, vary your oils. Again, in our diet, it's really easy to get something like vegetable oil, which is usually made from corn or soy, or canola oil or olive oil. But if you stick to just one type of oil for your cooking, you're actually missing out on really great um, fatty acids and uh, nutrients that are in the variety of vegetables. Um, why do we need fatty acids? Actually, every cell in our body contains fatty acids and our immune system 
is uh, really dependent on fats that we have to get from our diet called essential fatty acids. Um, so just by getting a lot of good healthy fats in our diet, we can reduce inflammation uh, and help handle um, our immune system. So here's some ideas to using different oils. For salad dressing, you might mix, uh, mix some vinegar or lemon with flaxseed oil or hemp or pumpkin seed or walnut oil. Um, olive and grapeseed and sesame oil are really great for sauteing. And then um, some oils that have a higher smoke point, uh, coconut oil, avocado, safflower, or canola are really great for longer frying or baking. So let me go back to some questions uh, that a few of you have asked me. Um, one question is um, not being able to eat fiber rich foods. Um, that are really troublesome. This is really common in those with um, celiac disease and other gastrointestinal disorders. Sometimes it's an indicator of bacterial overgrowth, um, but a lot of times people, these foods, um, these FODMAPs, I'm sorry, these fibers are highly fermentable. That's why I just said FODMAP. Um, and certain fibers are fermented by the gut bacteria and cause a lot of gas and even diarrhea. Um, so I do recommend to that viewer to looking into a low FODMAP diet because there are foods that are still rich in fiber, but are ones that are not as fermentable by gut bacteria and they might be uh, tolerated better. Okay, next question. Um, I do have a question about diabetes that I am going to forward to the glue community. So Jody, I have a question and I will uh, respond to it later. If you can uh, message me your email address, I'll be sure to address that privately. Um, Susan, we have another question. Um, your type one is harder to control since diagnosed with celiac. Um, even being thankful to a gluten-free diet, and it's harder to recover from highs and lows. And it is common that people do, their um, diabetes does change or is more highly sensitive after celiac diagnosis. Um, and again, it may be partially due to the disease progression, or it might be due to um, maybe the, the different gluten-free carbohydrates that are being used. I think that perhaps Anna's advice of using, um, you know, sweet potatoes and really whole grains that are rich in fiber might um, help with your glycemic control. Um, I'm going to stay on the line if anyone has additional questions, um, but I do want to point out that all of the resources are going to be available at celiac.org. Um, ask dietitian and webinars is where um, we will be posting the recording of this webinar and we'll post links to um, you know everything that was mentioned in this webinar. Um, our next webinar is going to be Wednesday, February 18th. I'm really <coughs> excited about this topic. For February, we're going to talk about heart health and we're going to have a great uh, guest speaker talking about gluten and medications, some pretty breaking news about gluten and medications. We're going to introduce Steve Plogstead, who is the pharmacist uh, that runs glutenfreedrugs.com. So please be sure to tune into that. We'll be sending out the invitation uh, to attend that webinar later. And thank you all uh, for participating, especially T1D Exchange. Uh, for sharing their resources with us. Uh, Rebecca, regarding Boost, Boost, I would say liquid supplements like Boost are a really good option for weight gain. Um, liquid foods tend not to fill us up as much and they're pretty packed, like they're really dense in terms of calories um, as well as protein. So, Absolutely, liquid supplements are a great option for weight gain. And um, you can also make some at home if you Google, you know, weight gain smoothie recipes. Um, you can combine, you know, nut butters or coconut or avocado 
um, along with fruit and make your own kind of smoothie at home.